Thank you very much. Please respect our seats. Thank you very much. Um, to all our guests from within our continent, who are present here, senior government officials from different parts of the world, um, captains of industry, people in the energy space, good morning and welcome to Nairobi. Before I make my brief statement, let me um, volunteer some information to you. I have been asked by the Minister for Tourism and Heritage um, to tell you that while you are in Kenya, you, you might have a small problem you may feel too much at home and going back to where you came from may be a challenge. <laughs> and uh, she asked me to explain the reason why. Uh, Kenya scientists, and I am one of them, have that uh, the very earliest remains of man were found in Loyangalani in Kenya, meaning this is where humanity began. So from wherever you have come from, welcome home. All of you. Uh, I know you paid for your visa. You had to look for a visa to come to Kenya. Um, if the people of Kenya finally agree with me, the next time you come to Kenya, you may not need a visa. Because... I think it is unfair to ask anybody for a visa when they are going home. I have also been sent by the governor of Nairobi. He's my friend, and uh, he has told me to ask you to enjoy Nairobi, to give you a bit of geography. On one end is a canopy of a very good forest, and you have a national park with wildlife. Um, he's also asked me to tell you that uh, sometimes the lions and cheetahs break from the friends at the national park. So when you find, uh, you find a lion by the road, so be careful because it is not tamed, it is wild. Um, regardless, of whether we like it or whether we acknowledge it or not, humanity today must confront not just a defining moment in the history of our existence, but also the fact that the unprecedented existential crisis of climate change has a lot to do with our relationship with energy. Energy makes human life safer, human activity more efficient, and society better. The different ways in which societies access and utilize energy describes the contours of human productivity and inequality and also define our contribution to the worsening climate crisis. For these reasons, the world now has clarity on the right as well as the wrong way of sourcing energy. The question of whether we need energy at all shall never arise because that is the mandatory fact of life. The matter of how we cater for our energy needs must therefore escalate us to the highest priority of humanity's urgent existential concerns and must continue to occupy our thinking. In the discourse about energy and climate, it is impossible to be neutral or disinterested. We can be part of the problem and at the same time contribute to its solution in various ways. For instance, Africa, with only 16.7% of the world population, has historically been the world's smallest contributor to the problem, cumulating less than 2.9% of greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, Africa bears the disproportionate burden of adverse impacts of climate change, including weather phenomena,
whose devastating consequences range from drought and starvation on one end to floods, landslides, and waterborne disease, as well as massive destruction of property infrastructure and livelihoods on a scale that is unprecedented. Moreover, Africa is home of the world's greatest concentration of people without access to efficient and ecologically sustainable energy, with 600 million people having no electricity at all and 900 million people without clean cooking energy. Further, Africa as a continent is heavily endowed with clean, green, and renewable energy sources, as well as the essential minerals required by the global energy transition that humanity must undertake to avert a climate catastrophe. For the reasons set out above, it is both the appropriate and the iconic, and iconic that Africa has remained a leading actor and voice for climate action efforts. There is no doubt that for four decades now, Africa has been robustly and consistently involved in national, regional, continental, and global discourses aimed at finding effective solutions to the climate change problem. This commitment has highlighted Africa's unique place in the global energy and climate mix, and at the same time positioned it as the clean, green continent of the future. The 25th edition of the Africa Energy Forum, therefore, reminds us about the history, progress, achievements, figure, and consistency of Africa's commitment to developing a viable pathway towards energy access and effective climate action. For three decades, a broad spectrum of African agencies has assembled annually to pursue dedicated dialogue on our unique energy imperative. For 25 years, African governments, energy sector utilities and regulators, development finance institutions, innovators and technology providers have sustained a commitment to collaborate and take action to move Africa in the direction of its Paris Agreement goals. Kenya's experience of energy sector potential, policies, investment opportunities, exemplify the huge possibilities within the African energy and climate action complex. Allow me to Decades ago, Kenya boldly invested in the development of its renewable energy potential at a time when it was not fashionable to do so. The decision has paid off. Renewable sources form 73% of our installed electricity generation capacity, accounting for over 90% of electricity generated and distributed in Kenya. Additionally, through appropriate incentives and a conducive investment climate, Kenya has mobilized necessary investments to install the biggest wind power plant in our part of the world, the Lake Turkana Wind Power Project. I heard ministers say it is among the largest in our continent. It is the largest in our continent. At the same time, we are steadily exploiting and deploying available geothermal potential, currently estimated at 10,000 megawatts. What Kenya has learned from these developments is that it is possible to achieve ambitious development goals while maintaining clean, green energy commitment. I think there is a proposal or there is a perception that development and green energy is in conflict or cannot be on the same trajectory. If you had any doubt as to whether it is possible to pursue meaningful development with green energy, you need not look further. Kenya is a good example. <laughs> energy is one of the fundamental enablers for the transformation agenda and our infrastructure component of our bottom-up economic transformation agenda. 
partnerships and collaborations in the energy sector are premised on the fact that Kenya is endowed with substantial renewable energy resources which constitute a highly attractive investment profile. The opportunities include, and I'm saying this because I know in this room we have men and women who are looking for opportunity to invest in our country and in our continent. One, proven wind energy potential of 30,000 megawatts with 346 per square and speeds of over six meters per second. A wind resource atlas is available to show high value wind power prospects. And I said that that atlas be made available and uh, transport also be made available so that you can go and see sites. The Lake Turkana wind power project with a capacity of 310 megawatts is the largest in our continent. And just the same way Davis has said he will arrange to take you to um, Olkaria, I suggest that he also puts together a plane to take people to this great project. Average annual solar insulation estimates at four to six kilowatt hours per square meter per day exist for both off-grid and on-grid options. A Kenya off-grid solar access project is under implementation but covering 14 underserved countries, counties. There is potential to expand the coverage to other needy counties and we welcome investments and partners to work with us either as investors on a public-private uh, partnership framework or indeed any other frameworks that can be negotiated. Number three, tremendous geothermal energy potential currently estimated at 10,000 megawatts, out of which less than 10% has been exposed. Kenya is already the largest global producer of geothermal power. 6,000 megawatts of both large and small hydroelectricity potential is also on the offer. 300 megawatts potential for cogeneration in the sugarcane factories in western Kenya is also available. To 131 megawatts of biogas potential using various feedstocks. A 2 megawatt biogas is already operational in Naivasha and is using flower waste from the flowers we are exporting globally. As already mentioned, renewable energy in Kenya currently accounts for 73% of installed power generation capacity. In terms of utilization, renewable energy accounts for 90% of the power generation dispatch. We are on course towards achieving our target of 100% clean energy in eight years. But additionally, we have set a target to 100% access to clean cooking by 2028. In fact, in our budget this year, we have done two things so that we can set ourselves on the trajectory to clean cooking. Number one, we are reducing taxes, the 8% VAT on gas, cooking gas. Number two, we are also extending, on the other hand, facilities that will make it possible to reduce our cylinders from about 2,000 shillings to between 300 and 500 shillings. Again, push the trajectory of cooking generation capacity of 3,032 megawatts. Kenya has made significant achievements in electricity access over the past seven years. It raised connectivity from below 30% in 2013 to over 77% at the moment. This success was driven by a robust policy and regulatory framework that enabled both public and private investments in the power sector to profitably invest 
public access throughout the country. This is how Kenya became a global leader in renewable energy exploitation and is on track to meet or exceed its Paris Agreement pledge, leading the way for more equally or even better endowed African countries to invest in renewable energy production. I am saying on this because I know we have ministers from our continent in our midst and welcome honorable ministers. I am saying this so that nobody should have any doubt that it is possible for us to avoid burning our planet with fossil fuels. It is possible for us to exploit our renewable energy potential that is abundant in our continent, drive our uh, development programs, develop our energy potential without necessarily putting our lives in danger as we are witnessing with climate change. Access to clean cooking is an important national policy priority and a fundamental component of our agenda. A bioenergy strategy has been formulated to guide the process towards universal access to modern cooking energy. In 2021, our energy compact on clean cooking was prepared and submitted at the high-level dialogue on energy expressing Kenya's commitment to accelerate access to clean cooking. As part of implementing the compact, Kenya is launching an energy transition program where all public institutions shall shift away from biomass cooking gas to cleaner and sustainable options. At the same time, Kenya advocates the establishment of the International Day for Clean Cooking as a way of sustaining the momentum towards universal health to clean cooking. As many delegates can confirm, and the rest will shortly do, Kenya is deeply committed to the agenda of the Africa Energy Forum. We affirm this forum's confidence that with the right policies, investments, technologies, and innovations, our economies can facilitate unprecedented transformation in competitive while at the same time making decision, decisive climate action. In other words, Kenya would like very much to be cited as an example that bold socioeconomic transformation and climate action are not mutually exclusive and indeed can be pursued most successfully together. I also want to state that Africa will remain an indispensable player in global transition to climate action, new industrialization, and green energy for a while, and for this will highly reward investors who are making their moves now or very shortly. The opportunities, I want to confirm, are vast. Sustainable energy development lies at the heart of our vision. Investing in renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal power is not only a full choice, but also a prosperous and equitable Africa. By transitioning away from fossil fuels, we shall contribute to global efforts to mitigate climate change, protect and cure a sustainable future for ourselves, for the generations that will come after us. Sustainable energy development requires sufficient scale to ensure universal energy access and affordability. There exist more opportunities to bridge the energy access gap and ensure that both urban and rural areas, undeserved community, underserved communities, and marginalized groups have access to energy they need to thrive. This calls for inclusive energy policies, innovative financing mechanisms, and targeted policy interventions to reach those who need it most. Isolation unilateral effort is becoming costly in the era of Pan-African regional and continental integration. Regional energy cooperation and collaboration are of paramount importance. By working together, Africa can maximize their collective potential 
and enhance energy security, stability, and efficiency. Cross-border energy infrastructure projects, such as regional power grids and interconnections, will not only facilitate energy trade, but also foster regional integration and inclusive economic growth. This singular moment, when energy connectivity powers African, Pan-Africanism, while Pan-Africanism drives energy inactivity, is also our opportunity to strengthen partnerships and build a united, interconnected Africa. I say this because as policymakers, we have agreed and we have decided and we have set ourselves to achieve consolidation of our assets, our thoughts, and to make our development inclusive. It is the reason why we have 85%, close to 90% ratification of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area because it is the instrument that will consolidate our synergize, create the single largest market of 1.4 billion people and being the youngest continent provide ourselves the opportunity to provide global labor for the future. In any case, by 2050, a quarter of the world's population will be living in the African continent. And the endowments that we have, the huge energy resources that we have, green energy resources that we have in wind, in solar, in geothermal, in hydro, the huge resources we have in sustainable agriculture, because we have two-thirds of the world's uncultivated agricultural land. And with our demographic dividend, we want to position the continent of the future, the continent that is going to um, drive green industrialization, that assist the globe in making sure that we have not just green energy and green industrialization, but assist in decarbonizing the rest of the world. We all agree today that the conversation is no more and should not be the reality. It should not be a North versus South conversation or rich versus poor or the emitters versus the non-emitters. We need to find a win-win conversation that will make the work with the, the emitters work with the non-emitters so that we can solve this problem. And hopefully we are going to have that conversation, the beginning of that conversation, the day in Paris, because we need a new financing deal that will make it possible for all of us as humanity to realize the existential threat that we face as humanity because of climate change. The North is as at a risk as is the South. The emitters are as vulnerable as the non-emitters. So we need to work together. This is not time for finger pointing. This is not time for claim came. This is the time for us to work together towards a solution to save our planet, to ensure that we deploy all the resources we have. First time, those of us from the African continent are not going to um, complain. We're not going to lament to anybody. We want to have a conversation of equals. We want to have a conversation of the assets that we have, we have huge renewable energy assets. 
we have huge mineral assets that can be used to deploy hydrogen technology to sort out the power challenge that we have. The North can come with technology and financial resources, and we can have an outcome where everybody becomes a winner. This is the conversation we want to have. It is not, it's not a conversation about aid. It's not a conversation about loan. It's not about debts. It's a conversation about investment, where everybody comes with their assets. That is the conversation we want to have. We should be discussing a financial ecosystem, a new international financial mechanism that is going to have no lesser or greater partners, that is going to be a win-win where everybody is treated equally. For those of you who are in the development finance sector, you know very well that today some countries access development finance at 10, 12 percent. Others access development finance at 1 percent, maybe half a percent. We are saying we should have an international financial system that treats everybody equally and that does not disadvantage others because of an element called risk. We must find a way of de-risking everybody and making development finance available to all of us equally. To ask for a fair international financial system is not to ask for too much. I think it's the fair thing to do. What we do not want is an unfair system. And uh, uh, any perpetration of an unfair system is unfair to everybody. And the good news is, is for the first time, climate change, there is no developing or developed country. We are all in the same boat. However hard you try, you cannot have unilateral action at the corner. If this place is burning, you cannot have an air condition at your corner. It will not work. You will have to find a way of sorting out everybody if you have to sort yourself out. So I think the, the sooner we realize that, the better for all of us, and we can all come around one table and have one conversation that gives win-win for everybody. This is why Kenya is honored to host the 25th Africa Energy Forum, which and why I am delighted to have this opportunity to engage with you. I welcome all visitors, wish you all a pleasant stay in the green city in the sun, and enjoy to make a little time to experience the warmth, luxury, beauty, delight, and charms of magical Kenya. And as Minister Davis said, I welcome all of you to the conversation of a lifetime of between the 4th and the 6th of um, September, when as leaders from this continent, we will be sitting down to consolidate our position so that we can contribute to solving the climate change paradox. We are putting our thoughts together. I am hopeful that in Paris we will be able to configure and agree on a new financial deal which we will consolidate and organize in September. We can globalize in the UN General Assembly later this year and we can finally sign off and conclude in COP28. I am very hopeful that we are in the space to finally sort out what we started almost 20 years ago at the first Paris Agreement. A lot of tension has built over time. Today, 
we need to go back to the principles that brought us together when we sat in Paris many years ago, and we need to finally bring this to a conclusion. We've been at it for far too long. And I'm saying for far too long because 20 years is a long time. And we have seen that it is possible to make long-lasting, fundamental decisions without spending 20 years. Let me give you an example. The current World Bank and IMF were in a small city called Bretton Woods in a record couple of weeks. Today, it is 80 years old. It was agreed upon by 44 countries, I think, with about 700 delegates. When Germany was faced with a challenge, it took them one session to change their constitution and raise $110 billion for their defense. After the Cold War, Europe came together and established the Reconstruction Bank that today is European Investment Bank. Within six months, it was ready, and within 18 months, it was doing the business for which it was set up. We have plenty of time between now and COP28 to agree on a new financing mechanism that is climate sensitive. It's, been, it's been done in weeks, it's been done in months. This one has taken years, 15 years. Don't you think, good people, it's time to bring it to a conclusion? I sincerely think it's time to bring it to an end. And COP28 it is, according to me. Finally, I look forward to engaging further with insights from the outcome of your engagements and wish you very productive deliberations and outcomes in your time here. The Africa Energy Forum is now opened. Thank you very much.